Hey folks, welcome back to another video. Today we're gonna to be taking a closer look at the 2024 Lexus GX 550, specifically in Overtrail Plus trim. It's a lot, but basically what that means is if you like to off-road, overland, go on adventures, or what have you, this is the Lexus for you. And so we're gonna look at very closely at the interior, all the features of functionality. Of course, I'm gonna take it on a test drive and give you my thoughts on that and any other impressions I have of the vehicle. All that's coming up right now. Alright, so here we are inside of the Lexus interior and as you would expect it does offer quite a bit of luxuries that make you feel special and help you feel good about the money you spent on this Overtrail Plus. Uh, mind you, you can get the majority of this in the regular Overtrail trim which on average is like $8,000 less. That's a lot of dough. So. Uh, food for thought on that. Um, but let's talk about this interior a little bit more. So this has, and I'm not kidding when I say this, uh, in terms of like the plastics, the soft touch areas, um, this is like, of course, this is injection molding, uh, plastics here. Um, they are some of the best I've ever experienced in any car. So I'm really happy about that because it does not feel cheap. Also, secondly, the leather is nice. I mean, you've got leather here, here, here on the steering wheel, here on the shifter, you know, the typical places you would expect to have it. And on top of that, you also get some um, just further hints of luxury. Like for example, brushed aluminum around the vents, around your console here, and a little bit there on the passenger side. And it's a really nice, real uh, brushed aluminum, which looks really, really upscale. Of course, you've got this giant infotainment screen, but is it giant? Nah, kind of not. I mean, it's large, but the reason why I say that is because technically it's 14.1 inches, but it's really just the top portion that is your infotainment. The bottom is actually dedicated to climate, which is nice because, you know, when you want to change temperature inside the car or any of the climate zones, I mean, you want it to be somewhere where you don't have to dig through menus because this does not have buttons. Where the Land Cruiser does have that in button form, here it's just part of the screen. But that does mean that this top portion is equivalent to the Land Cruiser's 12.1 screen. So just food for thought on that. This looks bigger, but in reality, it, it is the same. Okay, now in terms of Toyota's OS, I mean, look, this is really, one of the best infotainment OS's that I think is out there now. I mean, it's super snappy. It has everything you need. One distinction though here versus the Toyota Land Cruiser, and I'm gonna do this comparison because we just reviewed the Land Cruiser, is that there's a little bar here on the left that allows you quick access to your base Lexus applications. Where in other Toyota models, for whatever reason, that bar does not exist. You actually have to go into your Apple CarPlay or you know Android Auto and find the Toyota symbol, click on that in order to basically have uh, access back to those applications should you need it. I like that that, it's, that that bar is there and you know there's a little switch here, you can push it to expand the window and get rid of it, but I, I like that it's there. I think that's a nice, um, you know, quick access point. Why don't they roll it out to all their vehicles? No idea, but I hope that comes in a later firmware uh, update. Now, on top of that, 
let's talk a little bit about climate because this is where things start to change a little bit. Um, the first part is, yes, I like that the climate is always there for me to find in terms of, you know, my zone, the passenger zone, I can change that. There's auto features and the seats are also ventilated on both sides. They're also heated on both sides. Uh, for frame of reference, the back seats are also heated, which is a nice plus. Although you can't actually control that from here, you control from the back. But one problem that I'm having with these seats is that these seats in the Overtrail Plus are both not very powerful in their heating or ventilating efforts that it kind of bothers me a little bit because you spent all this money extra to have, you know, more luxury. And these seats just don't do a good job uh, with ventilation. I'm not sure why that's the case. I really love ventilated seats. They just don't do a good job. Uh, even the heat is not that good on these. Um, on top of that, if you do get the Overtrail Plus, you get massaging as part of the seat options. And the massaging, I was excited about because I'm like, sweet, I love massage chairs. You know, you're driving, you're in traffic. You know, maybe you're upset because, you know, everybody's crawling, you know, on the freeway or whatever. But when I turn on the massaging to actually do its job, it, it's it's really, really light. You have to really push yourself into the seat to really feel it. So I would like to see some more intensity there. But, you know, as far as the heating and the cooling, I mean, these are pretty standard luxury vehicle things. I know Lexus does a great job with that in most of the vehicles, so why do these seats not have that same level of uh, ability? I'm not sure, but I'm putting that out there because that is a little bit of a letdown. Other than that, you do get, as part of the package, you get a moonroof and you do get a heads-up display. The heads-up display is actually really, really nice. It, it, it has everything you need in front of you when you look at the window, but it also provides color in terms of anything that it needs to highlight, like in terms of a dangerous situation uh, or you know if it sees cross traffic, it'll alert you and it'll use color so it really catches your eye. I think that's great. And that brings me to another challenge that I'm having with this vehicle, which is all Toyota and Lexus vehicles uh, from now till forever are basically equipped with the Toyota 3.0 safety sense. That's great. And it's also not great. Why? Because there's so much alerting and beeping and in your faceness no, um, to the point where, I, I mean, it can make you nervous. And so I find I go immediately into the options to try and turn everything off. But this particular vehicle also has the option where it looks at your eyes to make sure your eyes are on the road, you're not getting drowsy, all that stuff. And that's really annoying because that. I haven't really been able to turn that off. And so, I mean, you can kind of disable it, but it's still on, it's it's really strange. So if anybody knows, put that down in the comments, but I, I'm finding it still watching. I do have a bone to pick with the fact that on the over trail, I don't believe you can get the um, camera mirror, which you can on the premium and the luxury, I believe. But if I'm wrong on that, let me know. But I, I looked on their website, I looked on the press release and it didn't look like that was available for some reason, which is weird because if I own this, I'm gonna build it out. And that could mean that the back of this turns into, you know, storage, kitchen, whatever, which means it will be harder for me to see out of the back. So having the camera view as my rear view would actually be extremely helpful and yet not really an option. Now. There are aftermarket companies that, you know, give you an overlay that you can, you know, attach to a camera and do all that. But like, why should we have to resort to the aftermarket for something they actually do offer? To me, that's a miss. I think that should be included in all the trims, really. And actually, it's even available on the Land Cruiser too. So to have an, an Overtrail Plus, which is the top trim for this vehicle, not have that as standard, to me, that doesn't make any sense. Anyway. So from all aspects of the interior, I think this is pretty good. I will say though, it does not really meet full luxury requirements for a Lexus. Lexus has vehicles that are much more luxurious than this and you can feel where your money went. However, 
and this is gonna be controversial, but I'm gonna say it anyway, I think it's okay. Because the price point of this vehicle, and it's not a small price point, I get that. Um, most people won't be able to afford this vehicle, but if you're in the market for this, to me, this is a balanced approach because you do get an upscale interior. And the proof is this interior versus the Land Cruiser. You know, Land Cruisers is nice for sure, 100%, but you can tell the main function of that interior is, you know, focused on doing things, daily life, you know, getting it rugged and dirty and not worrying so much. Here, you kind of feel like you have to be a little bit more precious, but it's not that high that you, you're gonna worry about it. So I like that it's not leather everywhere and everything is made out of wood and gold. Like, I don't want that necessarily in my overlanding, off-roading rig that I'm building up, right? So food for thought, just be prepared for that if you're in the market for this vehicle on those terms. Um, and then maybe just the last point is, you know, this is the only trim that gives you all of the off-road goodies that you're gonna need. And that's important because, so, you know, the other trims do give you all-wheel drive, of course, and, you know, they, they give you the center locking diff, I believe, but they don't give you the rear locking diff. And so here you have four low in addition to four high, which is what you're in all the time. And you do have the Torsen center locking differential, which is great. Uh, and that'll get you out of most jams. If you need more, you've got that rear locking diff, which is great. The one challenge that I'm having is that all Toyota products, Lexus or otherwise, they never offer a front locking differential. I struggle with that because I know other brands do, like Ford, for example, but I think they make up for it with their drive modes because here you do have MTS as standard with uh, downhill assist, uh, which is also a nice thing to have. And so through these different uh, modes, you can basically use them in lieu of a front locking differential. That's kind of the idea. Um, and I think that for this vehicle, um, it probably is you know fine for 90 to 95% of the situations you're gonna put it in. Uh, but it would be nice to have an optional front locking diff for something that's supposed to be a serious off-roader. One other little luxury that I forgot to discuss is really this guy here. <laughs> if you option it, you do have a cool box with drinks, which is nice. Um, and it uh, does an okay job. I mean, if you leave the air conditioning on here, it will cool these down, which is nice. Uh, the problem is this is at the you know expense of quite a bit of your storage. I mean, this, if you don't get the cool box, this is a huge amount of storage that's now taken up and gone. So if you're gonna option this out, you gotta think where else are you gonna put your stuff? Is the glove box enough? Are the door pockets enough? You know, maybe the back is where the majority of your things go, I don't know. You have to consider that for yourself and your situation, but just be aware, yes, this is a $170 option, I believe, and it's a nice to have. Certainly, if you're out and about and you know, you're thirsty, a cold drink's great but there is a cost outside of, you know, just optioning it in, you lose that storage. Other than that, honestly, this is a great place to be. I think that everything in here is well appointed. The Mark Levinson 21 speaker sound system in here does sound good and I do like it, but it's not every song sounds good. Certain songs sound amazing. They just meet the requirements of these speakers and the amplifiers perfectly. And I think this is about 1800 watts, but some songs just sound normal. And so just to taper expectations, it's not like some must have option. And I don't believe the regular overtrail comes with it. So just food for thought. Well, for me, I think that this is a really well balanced interior. It's not perfect by any stretch. I wish they would do better job with the climate stuff like we discussed. But overall, it is a nice place to be. It does make you feel special. And uh, I prefer it over the Land Cruiser for that reason. So two thumbs up for me. All right, so let's talk driving impressions. First things first, uh, this car is equipped with the EKDSS system, which is basically Lexus's way of doing electronically controlled automatic disconnect and sway bars and it does it in a way that is 
without you needing to do anything. Like literally automatic. Where in the Land Cruiser, in the Tacoma, in the upcoming 4Runner, you literally have to push a button and that will disconnect the front sway bar. But on top of that, if you kind of pick up some speed and go, I think 20 miles per hour is the cutoff. Once you hit that, the sway bar will reconnect. And if you're, if you come up to another situation where you want to disconnect, you have to hit the button again. So it's a little annoying. With this, you don't have to worry about it. It just takes care of it on its own. And that is a good advantage. However, there is one challenge with this, which is the way that we're able to make this advanced uh, disconnect system is by putting the mechanism and the sway bar in front of the axle, where on the Tacoma, for example, it's behind the axle. So why does that matter? Well, it means that the nose of this car is a little longer for more reasons than just looks. They needed somewhere to fit everything. And so therefore, the approach angle is not as good as it could be. Small price to pay, I guess. I mean, I can tell you that a lot of people are probably gonna put lift kits on this thing and you know different bumpers and chin bumpers or whatever else. So that can be fixed in the aftermarket, but it's something you should know. Now, how does that affect the driving impressions? Well, it doesn't. I mean, this thing feels really, really refined, um, but the suspension is a lot softer than I would expect. I mean, it's kind of too soft because, and I'm judging that strictly by how much body roll there is in corners when I don't even feel like I'm going that fast here. I mean, you probably can't tell on camera, but I promise you the top of this vehicle is definitely swaying in all these corners. And another fun thing is I took the Way Cruiser, which we did a review on recently, uh, on this exact same road. And I wanted to compare the two suspension systems. And so I brought the GX here. What's interesting is uh, the GX actually doesn't handle as well as a Land Cruiser. And I, I'm kind of blown away by that because it felt like the Land Cruiser suspension was kind of rudimentary, but here we do have active dampers. And I got to tell you, like, it's almost like, I don't know, the suspension is like trying to soak up all these bumps, not doing a very good job of it. And then at the same time, wanting to give me a refined experience. I think those things are opposing. And I think I figured out why this is the case. You see, this car versus the Land Cruiser, this has 3,000 pounds more towing capacity, up to 9,000 pounds. And so I think that means that the spring rate, especially in the back, has gotta be pretty high. And I think that high spring rate is really fighting the dampers to give you the better experience uh, that you would expect to have. So I don't know, the suspension system is trying to be everything to everybody. And right here on this really, really bumpy road, I'm not enjoying it and it's exposing its weaknesses. So for whatever it's worth, I think that's something to consider if you're looking to buy one of these things. Now let's talk about the steering. The steering does vary, right? So right now I'm in normal mode and you know, it's fine. It, it It's not too light. Uh, as a matter of fact, the steering ratio feels pretty good for what you get. I mean, I'm never gonna do hand over hand or anything like that. And the weighting feels decent. If I switch into a sportier mode though, now I'm in Sport Plus, it does weight a little bit more and then so on and so forth, the higher you go in the mode section. But I am going to dial it back into normal mode because this road is way too bumpy. Now, in terms of the braking, brakes feel pretty good. I mean, sure, it's a big heavy vehicle at about 5,500 pounds but they feel strong, good bite on the pedal. And I'm finding that even like in cruising situations on the freeway and stuff, it never bites too hard and, and like surprises you. Performance wise, I would have to say that this thing actually feels pretty good. It gives you plenty of horsepower and torque to pretty much do anything you wanna do, which is fantastic. The only complaint I would have is probably with the 10-speed transmission. Why do I say that? Well, it, it's pretty refined and I rarely can tell when it shifts gears, unless of course I'm shifting the gears. But this 10-speed transmission has a weird thing when it's in normal mode or eco mode and you're just kind of starting out from zero to like five miles an hour. It, it feels like it's got to really rev up the motor to get you moving. It's like this weird, 
Uh, it's a weird sensation. Like cars that have power shouldn't feel laggy. Right at the start of moving this vehicle, it definitely feels like you're giving it a lot more throttle than you have to. And that to me is a problem. Whereas I think once you're moving, it feels totally differently. Like now it feels like I have so much power. I can just put my foot down and it'll just rocket me forward and I'm gone. I don't know why it's got to have that duality, but it does. And it kind of annoys me. But you learn to live with it. You can also switch modes. And once you get into the sportier modes, it tends to feel better. All right, so sound wise, this thing is pretty damn good. Although, I gotta say that sound is fake <laughs> because it does not sound um, like the motor. It sounds like something that was synthesized, but it works and it will fool 99% of people. I just, I can just kind of tell it's coming through the speakers a little bit. And you know what? Uh, I'm okay with it though, because when you drive the Land Cruiser, which has got that four cylinder in it, it's not good. The sound is just not there. I think that that vehicle could be massively improved just by adding like a rear muffler or something like something from the aftermarket and it needs it here it doesn't really need it because that sound is is actually pretty good and it satisfies my desire to have a more engaging driving experience at times now you don't need you know rumbly sound off-road but you know it's nice on the freeway it's nice when you're making a pass and when you step on it to know that there's a little anger under that hood because the power you're feeling in these vehicles is really strong. And I would love to be able to match that up with the sound I'm, I, I should be hearing. That is old school in thinking. And in the future, people will look at us and go, why did we care about sound at all? Everything is silent. Why, why would you want to travel in silence? Um, but me personally, I'm not there yet. I like sound. I think it is a vital part of the experience of driving a vehicle that you pay a lot of money for. And when it's done properly, I'm very appreciative of it. Okay, so that concludes the review of the GX550. Hope you guys have enjoyed it so far. Now, to actually do a conclusion here, which is interesting. I, I think what we're looking at here is sort of the last of a dying breed. And I say that because this thing is still not a hybrid. Uh, it probably will be hybridized by 2026 is what I'm hearing. And that's fine, that's great. Everything's moving towards fuel efficiency or no fuel at all. Uh, and that's just the world we live in, right? But for now, it is looking like this type of vehicle is going away and going away quick. So if you're the kind of person that really appreciates a V6 twin turbo, that's kind of built in an old school way, like body on frame, you know, multi-link suspension in the back, you know, uh, independent uh, double wishbone in the front, um, you know, 33 inch wheels, sliders, skid plates, all the off-roading goodies, the mode, the drive modes, all that stuff. If you're that person, then you gotta get your hands on one of these as quick as possible because they are going away and you know there's nothing we could do about it but that also kind of justifies the price sounds like a lot of money and it is but if you were going to go buy a land rover discovery for example that's a six-figure vehicle and doesn't really offer you that much more outside of this uh, so this can be looked at as a bargain and honestly a better experience in a lot of ways it's a refined experience but if none of this is for you but you like what this vehicle offers you in terms of everyday livability, that's okay. Take a left turn, go study, and really spend some time with the Toyota Land Cruiser. That vehicle does offer quite a bit for the money. Uh, and actually, those are starting to get to the point where they're being um, dropped at dealerships for under MSRP. At least that's what I'm seeing here in California. So that's a huge value. <laughs> Depends on what you're looking for. But all that being said, guys, we are going to be creating a uh, comparison around the Land Cruiser, the GX550, and potentially a surprise third vehicle to be named soon. And uh, in order to be able to see that, guys, you got to hit that like and subscribe button down at the bottom, hit the bell notification, share these videos out. Helps the channel, helps me make more content for you. And so it's a win-win. doesn't cost you anything. 
if that's uh, something you're into, be great. <laughs> if not, hey, don't bother. It's okay. I understand. But all that being said, guys, hopefully you've liked what you've seen this far, and I will catch you on the next one.